Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Martha Moxley? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Martha Moxley was born in San Francisco, California on August 16, 1960. Sometime around 1974, her family moved to Greenwich, Connecticut. Specifically, they moved into the Bell Haven neighborhood, a very affluent area. In 1975, when Martha was 15 years old, she would spend time with a number of people in the area, including members of the Skakel family. The Skakel family comprised Rushton Skakel, and several of his sons. Rushton's wife, Anne, had died a couple years earlier. Rushton's sister was named Ethel Skakel. She was married to Robert F. Kennedy, who of course was John F. Kennedy's brother. Rushton was exceptionally wealthy and extremely busy. He did not interact with his sons too often. They were more or less left to their own devices. Two of his sons would be connected to the story of Martha Moxley. Tommy Skakel, and Michael Skakel. This takes us to October 30, 1975. The day before Halloween is referred to as Mischief Night in some areas of the United States, mostly in Pennsylvania, Delaware, New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut. It was not uncommon, especially in the 70s, for teenagers to sneak out on Mischief Night and cause various problems in the community. For example, breaking eggs on cars and house windows, throwing toilet paper on trees, ringing doorbells and running away, and in some cases, setting fires. Years later, in 1991, Camden, New Jersey broke a few records when 133 fire calls were made on Mischief Night. So Mischief Night didn't exactly have a good reputation as a safe time. On this particular Mischief Night in 1975, Martha went to spend time at the Skakel family residence. Michael, Tommy, and Martha sat in the front seat of a Lincoln that was parked in the driveway. They were listening to music. Around 9 p.m., other Skakel family members needed the car. They were planning on watching Monty Python's Flying Circus on television at a cousin's house. Michael claimed that he went to his cousin's house as part of this plan. Tommy indicated he stayed with Martha. Witnesses said that the interactions that evening between Tommy and Martha were sexually suggestive. Martha did not come home, and her mother noticed her missing. At 1 a.m., she called people in the neighborhood and the police. The next morning, she made her way to the Skakel residence and spoke to Michael. He denied knowing anything about Martha's location. Martha's mother suggested that Michael appeared to be intoxicated. Not long after this, a friend of the Moxley family discovered Martha's body in the backyard of the Moxley residence. She had sustained substantial damage to her head. The police were notified. They noticed that there was a trail of blood that extended from the driveway of the Moxley house back through high grass and ended under a pine tree where Martha's body was found. The police found part of a golf club, specifically a six iron, which appeared to be the murder weapon. Martha had been repeatedly struck with the golf club with such force that the shaft of the club shattered. A piece of the shaft had been stabbed into her neck. Based on a report of a dog who was barking the night before, the police believed that Martha was murdered sometime between 9.30 and 10 p.m. on October 30. But she could have been murdered as late as 5.30 a.m. on October 31. Golf clubs matching the murder weapon were found at the Skakel residence. They had belonged to Anne prior to her death. Not surprisingly, the police focused their attention on Michael and Tommy. The police were able to get an idea of what they were like by talking to witnesses. The brothers were rivals. Both of them were rambunctious. Michael had a drinking problem and was described as having a temper. Both brothers had a sexual interest in Martha. Martha had kept a diary which supplied even more information about the brothers. She indicated that Tommy had made unwanted advances 
on more than one occasion. One time he put his hand on her knee when she didn't want him to. Another time at a dance, he put her arm around her and was making moves. The police tried to determine if Michael and Tommy had alibis. Tommy said that he was with Martha as everyone else departed for the cousin's house, but she left only moments later and he went into his house to write a paper on Abraham Lincoln. Teachers said that no such assignment had been given. Fortunately for Tommy, a man named Kenneth Whittleton gave him an alibi. Kenneth was a tutor that was hired by the Skakel family. The day Martha died was his first day at their house. Kenneth said that he was watching the movie The French Connection on television, and Tommy joined him to watch the famous chase scene at about 10 p.m. Kenneth didn't notice anything out of the ordinary with Tommy. The police believe that Tommy could not have been guilty because the perpetrator would have been covered in blood and otherwise appeared to be in distress. Michael's alibi was that he traveled to his cousin's house at 9.30 p.m. and watched Monty Python's Flying Circus. He returned at 11.30 p.m. and went directly to bed. Rushton Skakel stopped cooperating with the police. He fired Kenneth Littleton, and after this, Kenneth's life spiraled out of control. He had bipolar disorder, which may have been aggravated by all the stress. Nothing much happened with this case for many years. The police had no leads. It went cold. Rumors persisted about the case in the media because of the connection between the Skakel family and the Kennedy family. Rushton was becoming aggravated and hired his own investigators to find out what happened. They interviewed Michael and Tommy. Both brothers changed their stories. Michael said that his story about watching TV at his cousin's house and arriving home at 11.30 was something he said to avoid being a suspect. In reality, Michael had snuck out of his house at about midnight, climbed into a tree outside Martha's house, and masturbated. Tommy Skakel said that he did not come into the house after Michael left. Rather, he stayed with Martha for 20 minutes. They engaged in heavy petting. So here we have both brothers creating some type of sexual connection to Martha. This information was never supposed to be public. It was collected by Rushton's investigators and included in a document called the Sutton Report. This report was leaked to the media in 1985. Even though the report implicated both Michael and Tommy, because they changed their stories, law enforcement believed that only Michael was involved. They had some additional information that led them to this conclusion. Witnesses claim that Michael confessed to the murder, or implied he committed the murder, when he was at a reform school. Also, just the fact that he was at a reform school was probably thought of as inculpatory. Another witness said that he never took that ride in the Lincoln to his cousin's house. Michael had also written a book proposal that contained information the prosecution considered inculpatory. Michael Skakel was indicted for the murder of Martha Moxley in 1999. He was convicted of murder in 2002 and sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. wanted to help his cousin get out of prison. Robert received a tip about a criminal named Tony Bryant who alleged that he transported two people to Belhaven on the night of the murder. He said those two people probably killed Martha. There is no evidence that Tony is telling the truth, yet Robert really pushed that story. After an unsuccessful appeal, Michael tried to appeal again in 2013. He said his original defense attorney failed to call an important alibi witness. Six months later, Michael's conviction was overturned. In 2016, the conviction was reinstated. In 2018, it was once again overturned. On October 30, 2020, 45 years to the day after Martha's death, the prosecution announced that it would not retry Michael Skakel. Now moving to my analysis. In this case, I think it's reasonable to believe that either Michael or Tommy Skakel was involved in the murder of Martha Moxley. Both of them had an interest in Martha. Both of them had an opportunity to kill her. Both had access to the golf clubs. The prosecution felt as though Michael was the killer because of his alleged confessions at the reform school and the fact that Tommy had a fairly solid alibi witness. It is unlikely that anyone else was responsible for this crime other than Michael or Tommy, 
specifically because of those golf clubs. Even though the clubs were apparently in the backyard, where anyone could access them, who would make their way to that area, walk into their backyard, retrieve a six iron, and then attack Martha? It had to have been somebody she knew. Again, Michael and Tommy seem like the best candidates. This appears to be a spontaneous attack that occurred because of rage. The perpetrator probably wanted to engage in some type of romantic interaction and was rejected. According to Tommy's story, he had been involved in a sexual activity with Martha. Michael was the one who did not, at least in the sense that he didn't make physical contact with Martha. He kind of had a solitary activity there in that tree, but that was different than what Tommy experienced. So in this way, Tommy obtained what he wanted to some extent, and Michael didn't. Maybe this led Michael to feel as though he wanted the same thing. Even though Michael's verdict was overturned, the prosecution still believes he was guilty. Several key witnesses died, and there was no way they could retry the case. Was Michael Skakel actually guilty? Let's take a look at the factors both for and against the idea that he was guilty, starting with the inculpatory evidence. Michael lied to the police when he was initially questioned. He snuck out of his house and masturbated in a tree outside Martha's window. Michael bragged about how he committed the murder and about how he would never be convicted because he was a cousin of the Kennedys. Now moving to the exculpatory evidence. No physical evidence connected Michael to the crime. No fingerprints or blood, nothing like that. There were no witnesses to the crime. Tommy Skakel and Kenneth Whittleton were decent alternative suspects, especially considering that Kenneth was Tommy's alibi. Even though Kenneth provided Tommy's alibi, in a sense, Tommy also provided an alibi for Kenneth. They were giving each other an alibi. What if they were functioning in a conspiracy? Kenneth Whittleton was offered immunity for his testimony, so nothing can ever happen to him at this point. Witnesses said that Michael was at his cousin's house that evening, although he could have committed the crime later. When considering the evidence, do I think Michael Skakel was guilty? I believe that he was guilty, but not beyond a reasonable doubt. One reasonable doubt would be those witnesses that said he was watching TV at his cousin's house. I think the police blocked themselves in by over-relying on the dog barking to establish the time of death. The dog never told them what all the barking was about. This is why dogs are not allowed to testify in court. They never explain the reasons for their behavior. They're always so cryptic. Now again, I think that Michael was guilty, just not beyond a reasonable doubt. So, as far as the legal standard, not guilty, but in reality, guilty. The whole business with climbing up the tree and masturbating is highly inculpatory. This is not normal behavior. It shows a lack of impulse control, obsessiveness, and a fixation on Martha. One particularly unusual element of this case is the fact that Rushton hired investigators. If he knew that one of his sons was responsible, why would he hire investigators? Also, why would he have fired the tutor, Kenneth Whittleton, if Kenneth was an alibi witness for Tommy? Again, Kenneth had immunity, so he could say pretty much whatever he wanted. If he wanted to change his mind someday and implicate Tommy, he could have done that. It was almost like Rushton truly believed that no member of the Skakel family was the killer. If Rushton had just stayed out of this whole situation, Michael would never have been arrested. I think what could have happened in this situation was that Rushton became disconnected from his sons when his wife died. It is not unusual for a mother to function as a mediator between a father and his sons, especially if the father considers himself important and kind of too busy for family items, like fixated on career. Without Anne the pitcher, Rushton did not know how to communicate. He let his sons do whatever they wanted, which is a good way for them to get in trouble. I think what attracts so much attention in this case is the Kennedy connection. Many people believe that this connection affords people power and privilege, not only access to good defense attorneys, but an ability to convince people to lie on one's behalf. Having powerful connections is usually beneficial in situations like this because it can keep information secret, but once the information gets out, it becomes a liability. Interest in this case was unusually elevated because of the Kennedy connection. Otherwise, it would have been forgotten about. Even to this day, 
people are sharply divided about Michael's guilt. Some people believe he got away with it because of the Kennedy connection, and others believe the Kennedy connection was the only reason he was ever prosecuted. This is a case that should have been fairly straightforward to solve, yet has become complicated with conflicting testimony, deception, money, and power. Those are my thoughts on the case of Martha Moxley. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis on this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.